Hello, I'm Richard Frieder from the Hartford Votes, Hartford Vote to Coalition. And we are very pleased to present these uh, brief interviews with candidates for the Hartford Board of Education, who will be on the ballot on November 2nd. The Hartford Votes, Hartford Vote to Coalition is a nonpartisan group of about a dozen organizations and agencies. And we are committed to supporting the democratic process and to increasing voter engagement in Hartford. Normally we host uh, live in-person events with candidates, but this year because of the pandemic, uh, we are instead bringing you these recorded interviews in the hope that uh, the interviews will help you get to know the candidates as you get ready to vote. Uh, for more information on the coalition uh, and for uh, lots of details on this year's election, uh, links to all of the interviews with all each of the candidates for the Board of Ed, um, as well as information on how to register, where to vote, uh, and other uh, important information, please uh, visit our website at www.hartfordvotes.org. We'd also love to have your feedback on these interviews and on our work in general. So again, we would invite you to uh, connect with us through our website once again. The address is www.hartfordvotes.org. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We are conducting one of our interviews with a candidate for the Hartford Board of Education, which is part of the 2021 election, which will be held on November 2nd. So we urge all of you to go out and vote. My name is Carol Mulready. I'm a member of Hartford Votes, Hartford Voter Coalition, and I represent the League of Women Voters in this uh, particular role. I have been a moderator for the League of Women Voters for about 20 years, and um, it has been a wonderful experience getting to know so many different candidates and points of view. A little bit about me, I'm a graduate of the uh, Bulkley High School in Hartford and really enjoyed my time there. So this is very nice for me to be part of this interviewing uh, a board candidate. And I will turn it over to Taya to tell a little something about herself. Hi, my name is Taya Vaz. I'm also a graduate of the Hartford Public School System. I graduated in 2018 and now I'm a senior at UConn Hartford. And now, Ms. Escribano, it is your turn to tell us a little bit about you. We said, you know, give a minute's bio of yourself. Absolutely. Well, first of all, let me just say thank you for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure. And Thea, I want to say you're a Promise Scholar, aren't you? I remember you. You are, you look familiar. I work for Hartford Promise. So it's, it's, it's awesome. And congratulations on being a senior. I'm very proud of you and all of our scholars. Um, so my name is Jahaira Escribano. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I was born and raised in the north end of Hartford. I live on Martin Street. So ever since I started this process, I've been known now as Martin Street Girl, which I, I take kindly to heart. Um, so again, born and raised in the north end of Hartford. I'm a first generation student. I am the first person from my family to have graduated past the 10th grade. And the fact that I went to UConn got my bachelor's and I have my master's in public administration. It, it's been surreal. It's been very surreal for me to even say that. I'm very privileged because of that now in terms of being educated. Um, it's given me so many opportunities. I have a large family. Uh, I still live in Hartford. I still live on Martin Street with my family. They're literally like right across the street. They drive me crazy, but I love them. And, you know, i uh, just want to make it clear that this is all new to me. I am the youngest candidate. This is all new to me. And as I am learning, I am going to be open to it with grace and gratitude. And I will always be transparent and open with everyone as best as I can. And just know that again, this is all new to me. And you guys are going to learn with me because <laughs> the political machine is new to me. And, and hey, we'll see where we go from here. But I'm ready to shake some things up. And I'm very excited about this opportunity. Excellent. We are happy to have you with us. Uh, so, Ms. Escobado, we will start with the first question. 
as um, we have all observed in the last 18 months, things have changed a lot and protocols are different. Online education was um, a new thing for everyone and of course affected every student in the state. Um, it became quite a challenge. Right. So what would your suggestion be to assist students who have fallen significantly behind and that are now back to school, face to face? To face? Right. That's a really great question. Oh, I'm sorry. I hear I heard an echo. I don't know if you guys heard that. Okay. okay. Just keep going. Okay. All right. Um, that's a really great question. Um, you know, this past year and a, more than a year and a half ago when COVID hit, none of us knew what to expect or what to do, let alone our education with our students and our teachers. Um, it's been hard and it's still hard. We can't not just forget that we're still in a pandemic and our kids are still suffering, right? The past 18 months has been a wash, so to say, right? Our kids were home trying their best to learn, but there were so many more immediate needs because they were home all the time now. You know, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's being homeless or living in a violent home or having to take care of their younger siblings or being or having the opportunity to get to work in order to have a little bit more money to help families. So there were a lot of competing needs that our kids were facing in the past 18 months that made it very difficult for them to stay focused and actually go to school, even though it was online. And listen, I am not against hybrid models. I am not against online teaching. Obviously all of us and all the teachers feel the same way. In-person class is the best thing, right? And we need our kids in person and our teachers in person, but we have to do it safely, obviously, making sure our teachers and our staff have the support as well as our, as well as our students. In terms of our students, right? They are far behind. So for me, the most important thing is, yes, we need to get them right back on track with not only their reading levels, their math levels, all of that. It's addressing those immediate needs that I just discussed, right? Our kids are still suffering. We're still in a pandemic and they're still trying to figure out and they're, and they're hurting. They really are hurting. So what can we do to help meet those immediate needs, right? Because that is the priority right now. And then we can talk about how can we increase SAT scores? How can we talk about getting you to that next level in terms of reading or being able to take your analytical skills to the next level. Once we address those basic needs, everything else will be a little bit easier. Again, I'm, I'm not saying easy as it's going to happen like that, but it will be more manageable for the students and it will be more manageable for our teachers. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to provide more support for our students for their basic needs, as well as their parents or guardians and as well as our teachers, we cannot forget our teachers. Our teachers are amazing. They put in a lot of work and they also need a lot of extra support after these past 18 months. Thank you. And Teo, why don't you take the next question? What is or should be the role of technology education in the curriculum for Hartford students? Right, that is also a great question. So. As I said, I'm not opposed to online stuff. Like, so online school is one thing. In terms of technology, we need to catch up. The Hartford School District is far behind compared to some other districts in terms of technology. Um, you know, not a, and I'm just talking about the fact, making sure all of our students have functional laptops, being able to have Wi-Fi, and thanks to some of the changes that have happened, because of COVID, people can get free Wi-Fi now, and there are laptops, but that's not enough. We need to bring that to the next level, being able to offer technological literacy courses for our students. We are in the 21st century. If you wanna work, you have to know how to Zoom professionally. You need to learn how to, you need to learn how to write emails professionally, have a conversation, all of that. And unfortunately our students are not, they don't have that opportunity right now. And if they do have the opportunity, it's very minimal and it's not structured and it's not equitable. So we need to put in more money and being able to offer our students more, whether it's courses or electives in terms of tech, um, tech literacy, we need to improve that as well as being able to get more computers 
for our students across the level and making sure like there is no excuse for you not to be online if we are teaching, because let's be real here, we don't know where this pandemic is gonna go in the next couple of months. And we need to be prepared for that. I hope we continue staying in-person learning, but it's always good to safeguard and, and be prepared for the worst. All right, thank you. Absolutely. And the next question uh, <clears throat> perhaps can also help you with your issues with the technology education because of the money that is coming into Hartford from the federal relief, uh, COVID relief right. money that's going specifically to education. Right. Um, right. What are some of the best ways that that money can be effectively used? Because it's a limited one-time money. What do you think is the that's best right. way to um, help the Hartford schools, the Hartford students, Hartford teachers with that money? You know, we are in very extraordinary times. Um, I don't wish we got this money this way, right? During a pandemic, I wish there were other better reasons applying for that for, for a grant. But here we are. This is the time. This is the moment where we must take advantage of all of those resources that are pouring in from the American Rescue Plan, as well as other federal grants and state grants. This is the moment where we have to be intentional with those sort resources is no longer saying, hey, we're broke. No, that's that's not an excuse. Let's throw that out. We have the money. What are we gonna do? So in terms of what would be great, right? To use that those funds in would be one, we are there's a shortage right now in the city of Hartford. We are we have shortage in teachers, social workers, it is bad. We need to pour money into that pipeline. We need to get more teachers. We need to get more social workers. And I know the superintendent is working on that right now, but we need to do everything we can so we don't have a shortage, okay? That is the first thing. That is the immediate need right now, the shortage of teachers and social workers. We need to do our best to create a better pipeline of not only teachers, but being able to get teachers and social workers that are from the community, right? Helping create that pipeline of, of Black, Indigenous, people of color from Hartford who want to be teachers so they can continue that. That's one. The second thing, as I spoke about earlier, is our students' basic needs. Our students are suffering mentally, physically, and emotionally. That is something that has always happened, but this pandemic has, has made it worse. What I would love to see happening is being able to get that money. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. We have a director of social workers. We have all of these amazing community organizations in Hartford, like CRT. We have pantries, we have therapy. We have a lot right now in Hartford. So it's not about creating a new organization. It's about grabbing all of these organizations that exist, getting them together in a room, which may seem easy, but it's not, and saying, this is the money that's coming in. We're gonna assign you this amount of money so you can go into these schools, right? Designating which schools they need to go to, rotating them and being able to provide those services on a consistent basis. We have the resources in Hartford, let's use them intentionally. Let's get them in a room, let's figure it out. Let's talk and figure out, this is the money you're, we're gonna give you from the American Rescue Plan. The money you can use from here is to provide therapy for this family or for these families at Milner School, for example. So, and that's just an example. Teacher shortage, being able to provide our students basic needs, um, that would be my priority, right? Like immediately. And then obviously later on, I would love to continue being able to fund more extracurricular activities for our students, having more um, opportunity to have sports besides football and, and, and basketball, you know, being able to do yoga if you want to do yoga or, or arts class or Tai Chi um, and being able to bring arts more into the schools too. Our kids, our kids are talented and amazing and we need to find other avenues for them to express their emotions and experiences. And I think we can do that with art and extracurricular activities. So those for me are some of the priorities of where we should spend the American Rescue Fund. In addition to that, I'm sure you guys saw um, the North End Promise Zone was um, recently given a $30 million grant from the federal government as part of an application. And sure, it's only going to the North End Promise Zone, but there's various reasons for that. 
The North End, uh, obviously, it's federally designated as a promise zone because of its poverty rate. And getting that money in that in that in that district particularly in the, will also be able to help with some of the things that I just talked about as well. So I'm really excited about this money that's coming in, these resources. Let's be intentional about, about it. And it's not gonna take one person and I can't do it by myself. And it's really gonna take being collaborative with the superintendent, with the other board members, with our community orgs. It really is setting our ego aside and really doing what's best for our teachers and our students. And we have to be innovative. It's the way that things have been done is not working. Let's be real here, it's not been working. So how can we flip it and do a whole 180 and make this better and make it efficient, make it so we don't have teacher shortages. So, te so students are leaving out of districts. So people want to come into Hartford and stay in Hartford and be like, you know what, Hartford has great schools. I want my kid to go there. I want them to attend and not feel like if you don't get into a magnet school that you're stuck. No, you should feel proud to be from, go to the pub or Buckley or Weaver and graduate from there. That's what I want that. And we're gonna, and I know we're gonna get there. Um, probably not in the next four years, it's gonna take, take time. That's one thing that's important to know. Changes like this do take time, but we have to have the courage to make them. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned after school activities to help enrich students outside right. of the classroom. So how should the school district address development of skills beyond computer literacy, like critical thinking and problem solving that are going to be necessary in the workplace for the future? Right. And, and that's key. A lot of our kids, and I don't want to say a lot, and you know what, I don't have a number, so I don't want to make up a number. But from my experience, we're being a product of the Hartford school systems. I'm not, I'm only 25 years old. Having nieces and nephews that attend the school system and working at Hartford Promise, I see firsthand that disconnect that you just talked about, right? Them not being being as well prepared to uh, independently and analy analytically think. My apologies, that's a that's a long word, <laughs> um, right? So for me, yes, the academics are important, but the extracurricular activities, right? That is going to be very very important. So we need to find a way to know. And again, this is going to take a lot of work and a little bit of, of, of collaboration, but for example, at, at Hartford High, if we know that there's a lot of students that are into, I'll give you an example, yoga or um, Qigong, right? Taking that extracurricular, extracurricular activity, right, and framing it and building a curriculum around that yoga, right? So being able to teach them the foundations of yoga and breathing techniques and giving them the opportunity to then do their own workshops, right? As part of, as part of that program, be like, all right, now you're going to be the yogi. Now you're going to learn how to teach a class and communicate and all of that. So obviously it's about building the foundation and giving them what they need and then giving them the opportunity to then do the same thing in return um, to their class, to that, to that group. So we have to make learning fun. Let's make learning fun. That's how kids work. Let's get Legos in the schools and have them build stuff and then have them think about, okay, this is, I'm going back to geometry. Geometry was not my favorite, but here's a home. Here's a square and this Lego. What is the area of this Lego right here? You know, it's about making it fun. And, and, and I think we're also missing that. And especially after these past 18th months, we have to make it fun. And that's how I think we can use extracurricular activities to help our kids pass the technological capabilities, right? Being able to think analy analytically and independently about what they're doing. Sure, it may, it may not seem important, but you're building those skills. You're, you're learning how to make a roadmap. You're learning how to set up a curriculum. You're learning how to communicate to people to, for public speaking. These are all skills we need. And I think if we were to do that more and our kids would be way better off, not only in terms of skills, but their emotions and feeling like they wanna to come to school and learn because they have those fun options. And again, that's not gonna be easy. Um, I'm not saying that's gonna happen from one day to another and it's gonna take a lot of work, but it is possible. That's the thing, it is possible to do that and to offer those programs and those extracurricular activities for our students. 
it is possible. And it's just gonna be a matter of us, you know, like I said earlier, putting our egos aside and coming together and, and getting work done. Like it's time, there's no more excuses. All right, thank you. Um, what is your opinion on the teaching of the history of race relations in the United States? And right. how does the curriculum of the Hartford Public Schools rate in this regard? That is an important topic, and I know it's a been a contentious topic um, throughout the nation. My personal opinion is this. We need it. We've always needed it, okay? We can't just whitewash that history, and we can't just pretend like that that isn't our history, right? Slavery, that is our history. Racism, it still exists in our systems, and it's still here. Jim Crow. We all, our kids need to know what it is because they face it and they need to understand systematically and how that works and how it impacts their life. And even if they don't face it, right, that discrimination or racism, regardless of race and gender, they need to understand that because this is about, this is not just about them, this is about the greater community. So you need to understand how everything is interconnected. And those classes will allow them those opportunities to think critically about themselves and reflect on how their actions impact others, but also systematically, how does that system work against certain people, right? And why is it working against certain people? How was it created? Why does it work that way? And what can we do to change that? Those conversations are important and I fully support that. Um, and I'm very proud of Connecticut for signing it that the governor Lamont um and in terms of like where we rate you know I am happy that we are offering diverse voices and that we're offering some of these critical um race theory courses even though it's not called that but they are offering these courses where they are talking about diversity where they are talking about race and they are talking about its significance right its history and its current impact however that being said, I think the issue that I have is that I wish we were able to get a little bit more into it. And by that, I mean, I wish we had more, how do I say this? Obviously not for, 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 for kindergartens, that's, that's a hard topic to understand. There's ways of talking about race at that age that's different than for a high schooler. But if we're talking about a high schooler, we need to be real with them and have these conversations. So I don't, the last thing I want is to avoid a topic because it has, you know, sexual assault in it, right? And, and, and this is hard to say, but slaves were raped. Women were raped, right? And that is an important part. And that, that, is, a, that is a tool of torture, right? So we need to have those conversations and understand that. And, and that is hard because people will be triggered by that sexual assault. And we need to be mindful of that. But I think there's a way of still having that conversation and still respecting that and offering the student an opportunity to step out the class if they were a survivor of sexual assault or, or, or you know, they've seen it or whatever it is, right? Offering the opportunity to leave or take a step back because the last thing I want is for them to be triggered and, and, and have their trauma, right, re-traumatized. I don't want them to be re-traumatized, but we still need to have those really dark conversations because it is part of our history and it needs to be talked about because that is a tool that, that, that they used. Um, and so I know that was a long answer, but I fully support it. And I think we could be doing a little bit more on it being mindful that there is a way of, you know, addressing it without re-traumatizing our students, obviously. And that, and that I would rely on our experts, on our social workers and our therapists to figure out how we can um, talk about that with, with our students. Thank you. Go ahead, Taya. And then for the final question, why did you choose to run for a seat on the Hartford Board of Education? The million dollar question, huh? <laughs> um, man, you know, um, I'm going to be honest with you. I, when I ran, when I decided to run, 
I was hesitant. I wasn't sure. So in the back of my mind, I always knew that I wanted to be a public servant, right? I just didn't know how that would look like or when it would happen. But one of the things that I've realized is that there's never going to be a right time. Never, ever. So might as well just go after it and do it and see what happens. Um, but the, the real reason I'm running well, is because I am a product of the Hartford School System. Very proud of it. I faced a lot of difficulties and a lot of, a lot of trauma growing up in Hartford and attending the Hartford school system. And it's taking a long time to resolve those traumas. Um, but I've seen firsthand the inequities we do have in our schools and we still have them. We've made progress, but we still have them. Our kids are not receiving the support that they need. And I have nieces and nephews that attend the Hartford school systems and, I, and it's still going on. And, and quite frankly, I'm sick of it. Right. And I know our superintendent, the current board and everyone else is doing what they can. I get it. I do. And I respect them and I'm and I'm here to work with them. But we need to do more and we need to do things differently. And that's why I want to run. I want to help shake things up. I want to help them think about things differently um, that they may not have ever thought about or may have been a little bit conflicted about. It's time to do things differently. It's not working. Come on. It's, it's been how many decades now? It's not working. And, you know, I want to raise a family in Hartford. I want to stay in Hartford. And, you know, when I hear people say, oh, but I, but I don't because the schools are terrible and they're not going to get a good education, I don't blame them when they say that. I wasn't well prepared for college. I wasn't. You know, I, I figured it out and I learned and I'm grateful for it. And I, and I had amazing teachers, the high school teachers that I could rely on and talk to them, but we're failing our kids and we're failing our teachers and we need to do things differently. And I don't have all the answers, but I know that I'm open to listening. I'm open to working together with everyone. And all I ask is that people keep it real with me. I'll keep it real with them and we'll figure it out. And it's not going to be easy. That's the thing also. Like, I don't want people to think that I'm going to go in there and things are going to change like that. It's, it's not a one person job. It, it does take a village, but just know that I am going to be there to be that voice where it's like, mm, are we sure about that? Did you think about that? I'm there to hold them accountable. I'm there to hold myself accountable and I hope my community members will hold me accountable. And that's that's the reason I'm running and I can't believe it, honestly. I can't believe I'm running for the Board of Ed. I think I'm, I'm a little over my head maybe, just a bit, but maybe not. No, but it is overwhelming as a young Latina woman from the North End of Hartford running. I, I don't know what to expect. And I'm open to that. And I hope my community members will be open to me asking for help and asking for their opinions and figuring out what we can do together. Um, and again, I thank you guys. And, and it's going to take you guys too working collaborative with me and, and the other Democrats and the other board members. But please hold me accountable. Please hold me accountable. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Escribano, for sharing your thoughts with us and the potential audience out there. We hope many uh, of the Hartford residents and voters will tune in to the opportunity mm -hmm. to meet you and the other members running for the Board of Education. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Have a good evening.